Hi, my name is Dr. Rob Austin McKee. I'm a professor of organizational behavior and leadership here with MGT.edu, the open access business school. Today we're gonna to be talking about principles of communication, more specifically, the art of public speaking. I'm gonna start with a quote from comedian Jerry Seinfeld, who says, uh, according to most studies, people's number one fear is public speaking. Number two is death. Death is number two. Does that sound right? This means to the average person, if you go to a funeral, you're better off in the casket than doing the eulogy. Uh, a sad commentary on how we feel about public speaking. Hopefully by the end of this talk, we won't feel quite so bad about it. So I primarily teach uh, organizational behavior and leadership courses. And there are aspects of those courses dealing with power, motivation, influence, leadership, all these things that you can infuse and indeed should be infused within an effective pitch. And we're gonna talk about some of those things today, including uh, verbal communication, body language, how to use persuasion and charisma, some of the myths associated with public speaking, and importantly, how to deal with the stresses that we might endure when we're engaging in public speaking. I'm gonna start us with a little thought experiment. We're gonna look at these two individuals here and come to some determination as to who seems more competent more leader-like, more trustworthy. And you probably have done so already. It actually doesn't take very long for you to just be like, uh, that one. They do studies like this where they show research participants pictures of two real political candidates. So people who ran for the same political office and the researchers know who won that political office. And they get a series of these uh, two person uh, setups, right? So you show two people and they ask the participants who seems of these two people more competent, more leader-like, more trustworthy. And they do this for, as I said, a series of uh, two-person candidates, and adults and children are about 70% accurate at the individual level and 85% accurate at the aggregate or collective level in choosing who won the elections merely by looking at the candidates' faces for two seconds. And these are candidates they have never seen before. So let's say we were testing can uh, some, we were conducting this study in Texas, right? So I'm a researcher and I'm gonna compile pictures from like state legislatures from Michigan and Minnesota and Maine. I don't know why I picked all M states, but that's just the way we're rolling today. Uh, and so, my research participants in Texas are never gonna have seen these people before. I'm gonna show them pictures of all, you know, the, the two candidate setups. Who do you think more, looks more competent, leader-like, and trustworthy? They got two seconds to figure it out. And merely by doing that, they're able to predict who wins elections. That is crazy, right? Kind of mind-blowing. It should be a little bit unsettling. It should make us feel uncomfortable. Why? What does that tell us that we can pick out election winners just by looking at their faces for two seconds? It tells us that how people present themselves is really important and that maybe the, the politics, maybe the message isn't as important as we want to believe that it is. Right? So looks, presentation matter a lot. And this begs an important question, or several questions. What does competence look like? What does a leader look like? If you were to say, uh, draw a leader, what would you draw? Who would you draw? 
We are uh, in the U.S. right now, and uh, I, I want to say we're in a tumultuous time, but I feel like it's kind of always been a tumultuous time, and I do believe that our conceptions of competence and leadership are evolving, continuing to evolve. But what does our prototypical leader look like in the U.S.? When we turn on the TV or we look to uh, Fortune 500 companies or we look at uh, political leaders, what have they traditionally looked like? And I ask these questions and I'll have students give kind of softball answers. Oh, Rob, they're, they're well-dressed. They're uh, uh, confident. They're charismatic. Yeah, 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 it's all that stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what do they look like? And then you get into some uncomfortable answers that people perhaps justifiably hesitate to say. And finally, a student will say, mm, they're probably male, Rob. Yeah, they probably are, right? We think of a leader, at least traditionally, we would think of a male. We're probably thinking of a white male, right? Um, we're probably thinking of a heterosexual. Um, probably tall, well-dressed, all that stuff. Probably somebody with, uh, you know, 2.3 children and uh, a dog, maybe a BMW, uh, an unhappy marriage, who knows? But we have this uh, cultural prototype of what a leader is. Is that what a leader is? Of course not, right? A leader can look like anybody. Anybody can be a leader. But that's our cultural stereotype. Other places have other cultural stereotypes of what a leader should look like. Important message here is that beyond cultural norms, leadership looks different to different people. What that means is that people will discount you, me, all of us just because of how we look before we've ever even had the chance to speak. Even if you meet that perfect cultural stereotype of a leader, you're an old white dude, uh, somebody is not gonna wanna listen to you just because of that. And of course, other groups uh, are likely to fare worse so we don't need to necessarily pity the old white dude, but imagine if you're a short woman, person of color, uh, that can be detrimental to how others perceive you. And there's nothing you can do about that in the moment. We are making great strides as a culture to overcome those stereotypes. But in the moment, what can you do to gain legitimacy? If you don't embody somebody's prototype of leadership, what can you do to gain legitimacy? I'll give you a hint. It is the topic of our uh, discussion today. Good communication. Good communication is our path to legitimacy. It is our path to winning over people that might look at us and discount us based purely on how we look. So, being a better communicator will enhance every relationship we have in our lives. So this goes far beyond helping us to pitch better or uh, give presentations better. This is about enhancing every relationship you have uh, with your significant other, your wife, your husband, your children, your friends, your extended family, uh, your dog, I don't know. Uh, so keep that in mind. I'm gonna start with what is a very popular idea in the world of public speaking and uh, persons who mentor and coach 
public speaking. And that is this idea that 93% of any message is transmitted non-verbally. So not the things we say, but how we say it, how we use our bodies and our faces to communicate that message. And it's broken down even further, saying that 55% of what we say comes from our body language, uh, which would include facial expressions and how we move our bodies. 38% uh, comes from tone of voice and 7%, a mere 7% comes from our words. So a question, does this reflect your experiences uh, communicating? Does this seem uh, accurate? Most people contend that it does. I've asked this to hundreds of students and I've had, you know, probably fewer than 10 that have been like, no, Rob, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. Most people agree with it and seems entirely reasonable. I'm gonna give you some uh, stories that will support that and then I'm gonna tear it down a little bit. So to support this notion, uh, let's start with this past the salt story. So when I was going through uh, an intro to psychology class when I was getting my bachelor's in psychology, uh, the professor one day told us about a research study called the past the salt study. So in this study, the researcher, researchers recruited a large pool of heterosexual male and female undergraduate students. So you've got heterosexual males and females age of 18 to 22, something like that. And they bring them into the study location which had a bunch of tables and chairs. So uh, a table would be set with two chairs and there's just a bunch of tables with two chairs at them throughout the room. And they paired people up saying, all right, you two go over to that table, male and female, and pair everybody up, fill up all the tables. And they sat together for 20 minutes or so and were only allowed to say three words to one another. Any guesses as to what those three words were? Pass the salt, yes. Uh, they were instructed to say pass the salt to one another as if they were saying, I love you. As if they were saying, I want you. I need you right here right now on this table, okay? So what's gonna happen over the course of this study? You tell these undergrads to go to say, pass the salt as if they're saying I love you. It's gonna be a little awkward at first, right? It, you gotta kind of fall into the mood a little bit and it's, it was probably weird. So I'm like, oh, pass the salt, okay, okay. Um, but as it goes on, you kind of find that mood and what was once, what was once a, uh, a timid, uh, pass the salt, suddenly becomes like, pass that salt, right? Uh, <laughs> you find the meaning beyond the words. The way that it's said conveys more information than the mere words that are being stated. And the myth surrounding this study is that uh, a number of the couples ended up dating and a few of them ended up getting married because they set that tone early on, uh, communicating essentially, I love you, I need you, I want you, uh, emotionally, if not by the words. So uh, another example of this, there were these commercials in, uh, I don't know, the, the 90s or something. I don't, I don't know if you've heard of the 1990s, but it was, it was a long time ago. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Uh, it was a strange time, but they had these uh, commercials, Budweiser commercials that I, I just, I saw them on YouTube. I just called them the dude commercials. So there's this, dude and he ends up in all these situations and the only word he ever says is dude so he might be at a football game and his team scores and he's like dude or he could be at home and he i don't know stubs his toe or trips or something he's like oh dude so <laughs> anything he was doing he conveyed 
like his emotion through this one four letter word. And he was able to convey a lot of different emotions. We also have four letter words that we're not supposed to say, but that we use all the time to convey our emotions. Uh, and you can use one of those words to describe like the best night of your life. It was amazing, right? Or it, uh, it was, it was terrible, right? Uh, so single word can be used to express a wide variety of emotions. That supports our notion that perhaps what we, the words we use is only a small fraction of what we're trying to communicate. Let's look at this from another angle now. An important question is where did we get that ratio? The ratio that I presented a couple slides ago of 55% coming from body language, 38% from tone of voice, and 7% from the words we say. 7% from the words that we say? Can the words be really just 7%? And does this ratio hold across all contexts? Is this while we're pitching, while we're uh, saying dude or whatever? I mean, it's an oddly specific ratio. And again, words just 7%. What well, turns out, this ratio, it's not true at all. It's actually known as the Moravian myth. So it came out of two studies conducted in the 1960s that involved a single spoken word. And the results from the two studies were just kind of combined to give us this ratio. That is absolutely terrible science, uh, both in terms of like combining results of two studies arbitrarily and just taking the results of a, of a study involving a single spoken word and saying it's applicable to all communication. Uh, the psychologist who performed these two studies, a guy named Albert Morabian, says that this ratio is a gross misrepresentation of his work, uh, both in those two studies and collectively. This ratio is trash, okay? And I say this sometimes to students, and I'll ask them about it later on a quiz or something, and they're like, oh yeah, the ratio is true, yep, because you said it in class. No, I am saying the ratio is trash. Just because we talked about it doesn't mean I'm saying it is true. Uh, this ratio might hold up in very, very limited circumstances when there is a disparity between what we are saying and how we are showing that we feel about something. So if you ask me like, oh, Rob, how are you doing today? I was like, I'm doing great. OK, I'm so happy to be here. Everything's one. In that case, you're like, Rob, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm sensing some kind of a disparity between what you're saying and what I think you mean. So in that situation, sure, the ratio might hold up. The words that I'm saying don't mean a lot, but in the vast majority of our efforts to communicate, our words are the most important part by far. How we say those words is absolutely important, but it's a secondary thing. If you think about a communication format like email, you don't get any of the body language, the tone of voice, the facial expressions. So what we say, that's it in that context. If you're talking to somebody or email or texting somebody, that's how it is. We've tried to come up with these little emojis uh, that like, they're kind of like little facial expressions. Uh, but that's attempt an attempt to add a little bit more um, nuance to our communication. If you think about other avenues of communication, like the phone, talking on the phone, you get tone of voice, but again, you don't get body language. So you can understand somebody in an email, in text, and on the phone fairly well, right? And that's because the words we use are super important. If words were only 7%, we would never need to learn a foreign language. Por ejemplo, puedo enseñar la lección en español, 
pero la gente que no puede hablar la lengua no van a entenderme, aunque las mismas personas saben el tema de la lectura. Una pregunta para la gente que no puede hablar español. Ustedes me entienden. I'm willing to bet that if you don't speak Spanish, you didn't get 93% of what I just said. Uh, just, just a guess, okay? Even though you know generally what I'm talking about, you probably could not give me back 93% of what I just said to you. So, we need both verbal and nonverbal communication, but I'm going to argue that for us, content is more important. The words we choose to use are more important than how we are trying to say them because we are probably not just communicating a single word to express how we feel about something. Our ideas are probably much more complex than that. And so we need to pay attention to our language. In that regard, I want to talk about a paper uh, called Learning Charisma by uh, a researcher called John Antonakis and some of his colleagues. This is out of Harvard Business Review in 2012. And it covers something called charismatic leadership tactics. We're going to talk through several of these and uh, figure out how we can use them to make our verbal communication what we say more effective. Start off with uh, a little quote here from my boy, Lil Wayne. Uh, this is him before he got most of his face tattoos. So uh, in the song Six Foot, Seven Foot, he says, excuse my charisma, vodka with a spritzer. What do we think he means when he says this? And I'll fully admit, I might be giving him way too much credit for uh, coming up with a slick little line here, but what does he mean here? Excuse my charisma, vodka with a spritzer. For me, I'm taking his, his message, right? Like what he needs to say, what we all need to say as the vodka, right? Something that hits hard. Not everybody can take straight vodka, right? Some people need a little spritzer in that vodka to make it more palatable. And for me, that's what the charisma is. So you have this message, you need to put in a little, a little spritzer, a little charisma, just to make that message more palatable to a wider audience. So that's how I want us to think about charisma. It's just something we can add to the content, the message that we have to make it more appealing to other people. So what is charisma? What do we mean by this? Uh, how are these tactics going to make us charismatic? Uh, I ask this question in class a lot, you know, well, what is charisma? And people are like, oh, it's, uh, it's how you feel about somebody or how they make you feel, something like that. And uh, it's like, you just, you, you, charisma, you like the person or uh, something like that, right? Something like that. I just looked up on Google, said, uh, what is charisma, Google? Please let me know. Uh, Google said is, it is a compelling attractiveness or charm that can inspire devotion in others. Compelling attractiveness or charm that can inspire devotion in others. That sounds like a wonderful thing to be able to pull out of your back pocket and be like, boom, charisma. Spritza, right? That is something worth developing if indeed it can be developed. And I'm going to argue that it can be developed. So uh, this is just an interesting little thing that I did when I was putting this together, looking at uh, how much charisma has been mentioned in books and the popular press over time. Uh, basically, over the last 100 years, from 1920 to 2019, and uh, you can see in 1920 there, eh, not much mention. And steadily growing over time, and over the last uh, century, half century, 20 years, 10 years even, there has been uh, a steady increase 
in our conceptions of charisma and scale that back there for us, that's, uh, that's pretty remarkable for a word to grow like that over time. So we're going to look at charismatic leadership tactics versus just standard good presentation skills. We're going to talk about those because they're important. Uh, but uh, what they did in the study for the paper that I mentioned before was they had participants come in and give a presentation. They recorded this presentation and they had external reviewers watch the presentation and rate the presenters on how leader-like they seemed. They then put them through training on these charismatic leadership tactics, re-recorded their uh, speeches, and leadership ratings went up 60% between the first recording and the second recording. So these tactics that we're going to talk about can be incredibly powerful in helping others to perceive you as being more leader-like and charismatic. We're going to talk about 14 verbal tactics. So that's uh, involving the actual words that we're saying. Three nonverbal tactics, that's how we say them. And uh, as I said, we're going to start with good presentation skills. So the first thing is tempo. That is how fast we are speaking. We can measure that in words per minute. And indeed, if you ever have to write out a speech, and if you're ever giving a pitch or a presentation that's really important, I do suggest you write it out. Proper words per minute, about 150, okay? So that means if you had to give a, a four minute talk, that's 600 words. Uh, that might seem a little bit fast, but actually it's a pretty good rate of speaking. It allows you to speed up when you need to and slow down at other times. A sense of presence. So seeming like you are engaged, like you want to be there, like uh, you're not looking at the floor or looking at the walls or looking at the ceiling, you're looking at your audience. Uh, structure. So this benefits you as a presenter and your audience. What it means is um, basically, do your paragraphs make sense? Do your flow of ideas make sense? Does it seem like just a stream of consciousness or do, do the ideas build throughout? Can you map out what you're trying to do in this speech? Does it make sense? It helps you if you have to give a speech because it's way easy to remember something that's structured, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, than it is if it's unstructured. F, C, A, B, I, I don't know, right? It helps your audience because this is the first time they're hearing this sequence of ideas. So, if there isn't some narrative thread connecting everything, you're gonna lose them. Language. Uh, this deals with the actual words that we use. This is really important because if you're pitching about some specific idea, if you're giving a, a business pitch, a, a startup pitch, uh, a pitch about some idea that you probably know more about than your audience knows, you might be tempted to use language that your audience is not familiar with. You might be tempted to use a big word that you're aware of and makes you sound super smart, but your audience is like, I don't know what that word is. And if you do that, your audience in that moment has two options. They can either let that word just float on by not knowing what it means, in which case you kind of lost them. Or they can stop listening to you if they have the luxury of looking up the word. Uh, and if they stop listening to you to look up the word, again, you kind of lost them. So use words that are appropriate to your audience or explain those words during a presentation. And finally, articulation. This is how we enunciate our words, how we actually speak them. And this merits special attention in a highly diverse environment. 
uh, like the startup environment in Houston or my MBA classrooms, very diverse. Uh, I talk about this because I've had numerous students come up to me before a presentation and say, Rob, you know, I'm, I'm really nervous about this presentation. I have an accent and I don't want that accent to reflect upon me negatively or to result in me getting a worse grade. That's kind of hard to hear, right? Because an accent, it's an important part of who we are, our cultural heritage, our family heritage. And people shouldn't be ashamed of their accents. Uh, we all actually have accents, right? If I were to try to speak, like when I spoke Spanish earlier, you can probably tell I'm not a native Spanish speaker. Uh, any other language that I know little bits and pieces of, like I have an accent. I don't feel bad about that. Nobody should feel bad about having an accent. That said, if we are grossly mispronouncing words, that is going to hurt us. So to the degree that you can, try to pronounce words correctly, even if you are speaking in a foreign language or a second language for you. So we're gonna jump into these charismatic leadership tactics now, CLTs. We're gonna start off with the verbal ones. First one up, metaphors, similes, and analogies. So you might remember these from uh, seventh grade or eighth grade uh, English class. Um, they're used a lot in uh, songs, music, right? Uh, so a metaphor is something like, uh, she was a, a raging sea of passion. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why that's what came to mind, but that would be a metaphor, right? She was a raging sea of passion, okay? Uh, she wasn't literally a raging sea, but as a metaphor, you understand what I'm trying to say there, right? A uh, simile is like, she was like a raging sea of passion. An analogy is they're really helpful for uh, startups medical devices like the one uh, I worked on. So we did hand tendon repair. So if you severed a tendon in your hand, we had a better way to repair it. Uh, when we explain this to surgeons, we would say this device that we have is analogous to a device that you're already using called a venous coupler. This was something that helped to uh, connect veins back together if you'd ever severed a vein. So we were able to make that analogy and help to simplify our idea and make it relevant to our audience. So this is incredibly powerful. If you can take what you're doing and present it in terms of a metaphor, a simile, analogy, to simplify it and make it more relevant to your audience, that is only going to help you. Uh, the next thing up, stories and anecdotes. So uh, there's a great TEDx talk by this guy named Yuri Hassan. Uh, if you're able to watch it, I recommend you do so. He uh, did studies wherein he would take somebody who was telling a story and put them in an fMRI machine. So the fMRI machine is recording like a sequence of brain activities in different brain regions. And then he would put somebody uh, in the machine to listen to a recording of that first person story. And when he did that, he saw a similar pattern of brain region activation in the person listening to the story as was exhibited by the person telling the story. So if you tell a story to somebody, you're literally changing, if they're paying attention to you, of course, <laughs> you're literally changing what's going on in their brain, brain pattern activation. Amazing, right? Stories are incredibly powerful. Advertisers know this. That's why they give us testimonials and ads. They show us somebody who has supposedly actually used the product and found great success with it. If you think about those uh, late night infomercials, there's some like, I don't know, stupid like little sandwich maker that's supposed to be more healthy than other options, like a little panini maker. Oh, look, you put the bread in there and some vegetables and you get a healthy sandwich. Or it's some piece of exercise equipment that uh, just doesn't even make sense. But they bring out some person to say, I actually bought that panini maker and I use it every single day and it's amazing, it's easy, the cleanup's easy, the food's delicious. 
you can do it too. Or I got that piece of exercise equipment. I get on that stupid thing every day and I use it and I've lost 800 pounds using that piece of exercise equipment. You can too. The point of testimonials is to get the audience to put themselves in that person's shoes, to get the audience to say, I want to be like that person. I want to eat healthier. I want to exercise more. So I need to buy this stupid thing. Uh, finally, stories and anecdotes allow us to showcase our values without being preachy. So you can tell a story about how you used to make tamales with your abuelita or something and show that you value family without being preachy and saying family's super important, right? You show it through this story of you making food with your grandma rather than preaching to your audience. Uh, finally, contrasts. So this is comparing one thing with another. And in a pitch for uh, a startup or uh, some other entrepreneurial endeavor, this is almost inherent to that pitch because you're showing this uh, utopia, this beautiful world that exists if your business becomes a reality or if your technology hits the market. And you're contrasting that with the world as it currently is which is less than perfect without your business, your idea, your technology, whatever it is. But you can think about this uh, more proactively and use it more proactively. Say, okay, how can I really paint this full contrast between these two things? Uh, next up, we have rhetorical questions. What's the point of a rhetorical question? Hmm? Ah, uh, <laughs> so rhetorical questions, they, uh, oop, didn't mean to hit that yet. Rhetorical questions can ser serve two purposes. One, they can uh, help us to realize how simple something is. The other side is to help us rep uh, realize how complicated something is. So we can ask a simple rhetorical question that everybody knows the answer to, something like, uh, you know, don't we all deserve justice? And you're like, oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure, Rob. Yes, I think we do all deserve justice. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. The other way is to ask a, a more difficult, nuanced question that you intend to uh, reveal the answer to during your presentation. So something like, what does justice mean? And you might hear that question and say, oh, I don't know. I haven't really thought of that, Rob. What does justice mean? And I would then proceed to reveal the answer to you. So two ways that we can use rhetorical questions. Either way, it's a highly effective technique and it works well as a transition. So if I'm you know, doing a typical startup pitch and I'm presenting the problem, right? This is the problem that exists in the world. And then I want to transition to my solution to that problem. Uh, a cliched way to do that is like, so what can we do about this problem, right? It's a little cliched and hackneyed, but it gives you that transition. Uh, the next thing up, three-part lists. Why would we use three-part lists? <laughs> Rhetorical question. Uh, so most people can remember three things. Uh, it shows proof of a pattern supporting whatever you're trying to support, and it gives this impression of completeness. You will note I used a three-part list to support my uh, bullet point of three-part lists. So uh, use that on your own. If you're ever trying to support some idea that you have, you say, we need to do this for reasons A, B, and C. Next up, we have expressions of moral conviction. You might think this um, out of place when we're talking about uh, tech entrepreneurship or small business entrepreneurship, talking about morals and values and stuff. But let me tell you something. 
If the only reason you have for doing what you're doing is money, I, I, I don't see anybody being interested in helping you, honestly. Uh, you need something more to that. There's got to be some reason that you care about this idea. And I don't think that you should be scared of saying, I care about this because of this moral uh, value laden or ethical reason. Okay. Uh, statements that reflect the sentiments of the group. So again, if you're giving a pitch, right? If it's in front of potential investors or uh, volunteers, mentors, whoever it is, realize those people showed up to watch your pitch for a reason, right? They're not paid to be there. They are there because they want to be there. So there is some common interest threading through that group. There is some common sentiment threading through that group don't be afraid to speak to that. Uh, next up, we have high goals and confidence. Generally, having high goals is not a problem for uh, particularly tech entrepreneurs. They're like, yeah, we're going to take over the world. We're going to make all this money. It's going to be, you know, we have all these charts and projections. Uh, maybe a little too much confidence. You want to have a reasonable degree of, conf of uh, reasonable high goals, reasonable degree of confidence, but you certainly want to have reasonably ambitious goals and a reasonably high confidence that you can achieve those goals. Uh, people are going to feed off of that confidence. Next up, humor. Humor is a tough one. Okay. If you're writing out a speech, you're probably going to put like, you're going to write out the joke and sometimes writing out a joke, uh, it doesn't come out the same way as if you make it up on the spot or, you know, it, it can go very poorly if you're trying to uh, deliver humor from a, a canned or written joke. So make sure you test it out. Make sure it works because you don't want to get up there, like tell a joke and have the joke fall flat. And then you're like, oh, that was awkward because uh, your audience is going to be feeling that also. They're going to be like, oh, that was awkward. So just be careful with that one. Uh, history. So invoking history. This is not your history. If you are talking about your history, that is called storytelling. This is invoking history book history. It can be very powerful if used effectively. Next is a sense of urgency. Why do we need your idea now? Why is now the time? Why can't we wait another year, five years, 10 years? Why do we need this thing right now? Tell us why. Create that sense of urgency from us. Sacrifice. This is talking about uh, the sacrifice of you, your colleagues, your company, what have you. I'm going to tell you generally not to use this one, generally not to speak about your own uh, sacrifices because, frankly, people don't care. Uh, <laughs> until you are rich and famous, Nobody cares about what you is about all you've been through. Uh, once you're rich and famous, everybody wants to hear about every little trial and tribulation that you ever had. Cause they're like, Oh, okay. So this person, uh, all right. They feel like they can learn from you because you've been successful. But if you haven't made, if you're not successful yet, uh, just, just, just write it down all your trials and tribulations. So that the day you become rich and famous, you're like, Oh, I'm ready to go. Let's talk about my sacrifices. Uh, repetition, sense of repetition. So if you think, uh, that you have a short phrase that is worth repeating a couple times in your presentation, maybe in the beginning or the end, do so. That can be a very uh, powerful technique. Be careful with that. Don't overdo it. Uh, this has been used to great effect in, in music. Right. A big part of the reason that we like the music that we like is because it relies on repetition of certain themes, motifs and ideas. Uh, the uh, I have a dream speech used a, a form of repetition called anaphora. You know why it's called the I have a dream speech? Because he says I have a dream in that speech over and over again. OK. 
Just because he gets away with it doesn't mean you should try to do that, uh, especially if you have four minutes to give a content-based speech. Uh, but a very effective technique. You are, of course, welcome to create your own tactics. Don't limit yourself to the ones I used here. I just mentioned anaphora used by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King in the I Have a Dream speech. Very effective in that context, but easy to overdo and abuse that one. Alliteration. So this is using uh, uh, similar sounds. Uh, so just starting a, a sequence of similar sounds. There, that's alliteration. So starting words with the same letter, or a series of words with the same letter, can be very effective in drawing the uh, listener in and creating some interest in what you're saying. Cultural references. So I just gave a cultural reference, right? That reference to Dr. Martin Luther King. That can be an effective tactic, not just uh, King, but you know, uh, cultural references that are appropriate to what you're talking about. And uh, inspirational quotes. This is kind of related to cultural references, but saying, you know, uh, this person said, I have a dream, right? So again, it should be relevant to what you're talking about, uh, but can be highly effective. I would argue if you're using an inspirational quote, it should be pretty short. Uh, the quote that I used at the beginning of this from Jerry Seinfeld, to me, that one is even a little bit long. I personally would shorten that, but then it wouldn't be a direct quote. Uh, so I left it as is. Uh, I have a quote coming up later that's gonna be much shorter. I think an inspirational quote should be 10 to 15 words, no longer than that. Uh, influence tactics are a separate piece of the literature, but they are related to charismatic influence tac or charismatic leadership tactics. I'm going to talk through a few of these uh, just to give us uh, kind of a broader framework of what we're trying to do with influence tactics and charismatic leadership tactics. So the first one of these is inspirational appeals. This is speaking to your audience's sense of values, morality, ethics. It's uh, related to one of the charismatic leadership tactics that we talked about, but I mention it here separately because when we speak to the audience's sense of ethics, morality, and values, we're speaking to a certain part of them, right? We're speaking kind of to the heart. And we can uh, kind of balance that out with this idea of rational persuasion. So that is using facts, evidence, data, statistics to support what we're saying. So do you know that 83% of people respond to inspirational appeals? I just made that up, but that would be a use of rational persuasion. So whereas inspirational appeals speak to the heart, rational persuasion speaks to the mind. And that gives us this balanced approach. We wanna use both of those approaches because you don't know what somebody in your audience is going to respond to. If they're gonna to respond to more of the emotional side or the logical, rational side. So you wanna make sure that you use both approaches in what you're saying. Uh, Collaboration and consultation are important. Uh, these involve kind of getting the audience involved in what you're doing, engaging the audience beyond just listening to you. So uh, collaboration and consultation involve you saying to the audience, hey, if you have any ideas about how I could make this better, about how I could improve this idea, this technology, this business, please reach out to me and let me know. And it involves you saying to the audience, hey, if you have any questions, if you want any more information about this, let me know and I would be happy to provide it. So one is saying, hey, I'll help you. And the other is, how can you help me? Both of these combined create this idea of community, this sense of us being in it together, which is incredibly powerful. And uh, the last two I have up here 
apprising and ingratiation. So these two are on the bottom because to me, they're the ones that you should uh, resort to last. Apprising is telling your audience what's in it for them. So, hey, here are the, the benefits that you might accrue from my idea, my technology, my whatever. And ingratiation is uh, basically flattery. Uh, saying nice things about your, oh, you're someone as intelligent as you. That's a lovely shirt you have on, by the way. Uh, be careful with that one, because it's easy to overdo it or to seem disingenuous when you're ingratiating. Make sure that it's sincere and that it comes off uh, as warm and kind and not as... Uh, well, there, we have a lot of bad terms to describe people who do it the bad way. Uh, just don't do it the bad way. So nonverbal CLTs. So we've discussed the verbal stuff, like how to actually improve the words that we're saying. Now let's talk about how to say it better. Why do we have actors? This goes directly into this idea of nonverbal CLTs. If you uh, imagine that we're movie producers and we have this script and we wanna make a movie, we wanna get the best actors for this uh, movie. So we bring in a bunch of actors and they're all reading the same words, right? So the verbal part of the communication is going to be the exact same but different actors are gonna bring in different nonverbal tactics, right? They're gonna have different facial expressions, different tones of voice, different uh, gestures. That's why we don't just use like whoever won the uh, Oscar for best actor last year. So oh, we'll just use that person for every single movie next year because they're clearly the best one. They were the best one for that role, okay? So uh, nonverbal CLTs absolutely are important. Uh, they also allow us to engage in this idea of emotional contagion. And what does this mean? Contagion kind of sounds like contagious. So it's the degree to which our emotions are contagious. The degree to which others can be affected by the emotions that we express. And uh, so we can look at a baby like this baby. Whoo, that is an adorable little baby, right? If you don't feel some kind of little ray of sunshine on your heart, I don't even know. I don't even know where to start with you. Uh, adorable little baby, you probably feel a little bit happier right now than you felt before this baby was up there. You're like, Rob, I don't like that baby. There's another adorable little baby. So, uh, Realize that your emotions are also contagious, okay? You can walk to the front of a room and smile, a big authentic smile and make people feel better to be in that room listening to you speak. Or you can walk up to the front of the room, clearly not wanna be there, like, oh, great, thank you all for being, right? <laughs> and uh, we probably all had that experience before where somebody walked into a room and you could see they clearly wanted to be there. They wanted to be in your presence talking to you and you were like, oh, damn, I feel that a little bit, right? I actually wanna be here. Or you've had the opposite experience where somebody came in, clearly did not wanna be there and suddenly you didn't wanna be there so much. So uh, much like COVID-19, your emotions are also contagious. Uh, better in many regards than COVID-19, obviously. Uh, so uh, nonverbal CLTs above all should reinforce the message. You don't always have to be smiling. You don't always have to be happy. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more on the upcoming slides. Uh, and nonverbal CLTs help us to address this disparity between the rate of speaking and the rate of listening. So we can listen to things at a much more rapid pace than we can speak. That's why you can watch a YouTube video or listen to an audiobook and turn the uh, 
turn the speed up to 1.5x or 2x and you can still listen to it and pay attention and understand it. But if I were to ask you to speak at twice your normal rate of speaking, it would not go well. So nonverbal CLTs give you other points of interest to keep your audience engaged. They provide more than just the, the auditory cues, they also provide visual cues to help keep your audience engaged. So let's talk about voice first. There are uh, numerous uh, parameters by which we can measure voice, things like pitch, so this is basically the note or the frequency. If you were to walk up to a piano and hit a key, you know, middle C or something, that's, that's the pitch. You can play that same note on a guitar. The difference between pitch and tone is that you're playing the same note on a piano and a guitar, same pitch, rather, you're playing the same pitch on the two instruments, but the tone is going to be different. The tone of a guitar is different from the tone of a piano, even if you're playing middle C on both the same pitch. The rate, we talked about that before, 150 or so words per minute is ideal rate. Uh, volume, we have a pretty good understanding of what that is. Uh, and prosody is the uh, sequence of stressed and unstressed syllables, something you generally don't need to worry about, uh, but it, it can be important in certain contexts. If you're in a, I don't know, a rap battle, for instance. Uh, what I really want to cover with regard to voice is the use of dynamics. Things like pauses. think we're often afraid to have a pause when we're speaking, but they can be really helpful because one, they allow you as the speaker, me as the speaker to take a breath. Whew. And they allow your audience to take a breath and to uh, be able to, to catch up to what you're talking about. There's also this idea of uh, crescendos and decrescendos. This relates back to volume. So uh, crescendo is uh, an increase in volume and a decrescendo is a decrease in volume. Accelerando is uh, increasing the rate of speaking and retardando is slowing down the rate of speaking. I think a lot of times we have this great fear, not just of pauses, but also of decreasing the volume and decreasing our rate of speech. Because we feel like if we slow things down and quiet things down a little bit, you're gonna lose the audience. Like you have to keep this fever pitch of energy or the audience is going to become disinterested. And if you do it too long, absolutely the audience will become disinterested. But when it comes to a dynamic shift, an unexpected dynamic shift, this is an incredibly powerful tactic. Instead of alienating the audience, it actually draws them in a little closer. I do this in face-to-face uh, -face environments, and I can promise you that when I get to this part of this talk and I slow things down and I quiet things down, everyone in the room looks up at me in that moment. People who were absolutely engaged in their laptops or phones the whole time suddenly look up. And it's because when you speak like this, it seems like what you're saying is more important. That's it. Uh, what I'm saying right now is no more or less important than what I was saying before, but it feels that way, right? It feels that way. And uh, these dynamic shifts are an important part of song and story. If we look at the arc of uh, songs and stories, they're not just flat lines. There is, 
you know, this tension and release. There's this ebb and flow, build up, release. Some uh, very famous songs make use of this. Uh, Giuseppe Verdi in his uh, Requiem Mass, uh, Dies Irae, Dies Irae, I think. This song takes us from soaring highs, right? This is a classical music piece with a chorus and orchestra, and there are times when they are just belting out just the most powerful thing you've ever heard in your life, and there are times when it's just the choir, everything else is stripped away, and uh, they're almost whispering at you. The same thing with uh, Carmina Burana by Carl Orff, his, uh, the section called O Fortuna, Amazing piece of music. If you have not listened to this, you absolutely need to as soon as humanly possible. Uh, it will give you a great appreciation for dynamic shifts. Uh, James Brown, the funky drummer. And there's a point in that where he just kicks everybody out except the drummer. He just turns it over to the drummer. There's this, even though the beat stays the same, just the feeling of it changes. There's this dynamic shift because it becomes, you're just focused on this one thing. L.A. Woman by the Doors has this beautiful accelerando. There's a point where it drops off to, I don't know, half tempo or something. Accelerando all the way back up. Beastie Boys, Heart Attack Man. You might not know, but Beastie Boys started out as a punk band. And so they have punk in a lot of their music. Uh, this song, along with California Uber Alice by the Dead Kennedys, both of them come in as like heavy punk. And at some point they drop down to like, I don't know, a quarter tempo or something, and they just build it back up. It is very well done. Uh, and if you don't like any of what I just said before, uh, Childish Gambino, Me and Your Mama, has some really good dynamic shift in, shifts in it. It takes us full this, through this full sequence. And uh, again, really well done. Listen to these uh, if you're able to, to get a sense of uh, dynamic shifts. How they're used in music can be applied directly to how they're used in a pitch. Uh, and if we think about what happens when we drop things down, okay? Because we kind of, we've dropped the energy a little bit uh, compared to, you know, three minutes ago, four minutes ago, something like that. You drop it down. What do you have to do after you drop it down? I don't know if you know much about James Brown. He's a great soul singer. Uh, and <laughs> the reason that he did like drum solos was uh, so he could go backstage and he had a great love for uh, what we could call illicit substances, okay? So at some point in his little concert, he's gonna have to go backstage to reinvigorate himself with some illicit substances. And he's gonna kick it over to the drummer. You're gonna have this dynamic shift. And at some point he's gonna come back out feeling reinvigorated, ready to go. And um, so what do you have to do after you drop the energy down? You gotta build it back up, right? So he comes back onto the stage. Uh, he looks over at the bass player, he's like, bring that in. Brings in the bass player, so it's just the bass player and the drummer doing the thing. He's gonna look over the guitar player after a couple bars, bring that guitar player in, look over the keys player after a couple bars, bring the keys in, and then finally look over at the horn player, uh, horn players, bring those horn players in, and then he's gonna step up to that mic and do his thing, right? So if you drop it down, bring it back up to where you were before, take us full th through that full arc, right? So uh, following up on voice, next thing, speech disfluencies. This is the use of ums and uhs, uh, mostly when we don't feel like having a pause. We'll fill it with, uh, um, uh, I'd rather have the pause. A lot of times you're not realizing that you're doing these things uh, as you're doing them, but other people 
definitely are aware. So it is contingent upon you to realize that you're doing them and to try to correct it if you are. Uh, next up, facial expressions. How we use our face. Number one, smile, okay? If you don't smile at some point in your presentation, uh, you're probably doing it wrong, unless you're talking about just a very sad thing the whole time, uh, which is probably not suggested. Uh, you should smile at some point, probably while you're coming out uh, and saying hello to the audience. One thing I will say uh, that this reminds me of is when you introduce yourself to the audience, you smile and say your name, say your name slowly. Let people have a moment to meditate, to savor your name, especially if you have a name that is uncommon to your audience, okay? Because uh, I have students will come up in front of the room and they'll say their name, hello, my name is and I'm like, Whoa, what was that? That, that was the name? Uh, say your name slowly, smile while you're doing it, make eye contact with your audience if you are face to face with your audience. I know this can seem scary. I absolutely know that. Uh, and it's still super important. If you think about uh, like going to get your blood drawn, okay? There are people who will go get their blood drawn. You have to sit in a little chair and roll up your sleeve and reveal your little vein. And there's some people who sit in the chair and they just turn away. They don't want to know. They're just like, do what you need to do. I w wish I could just leave the arm here. I'll come back and pick it up later. People don't want to look. I understand that. But there are other people who go and sit in that chair to have their blood drawn, roll up their sleeve, and they're like, do it. That's how you need to be with your audience. Why would you ever look at that? Because looking is the only way to know you're doing a good job. And it might feel like you're being stabbed in the eyes with a bunch of needles to look into the eyes of your audience, but it's worth doing, okay? It's l worth learning how to do. Uh, eyebrow flash. <laughs> <laughs> so this is more of a pro tip. Uh, while you are smiling and saying your name slowly, just give a little pop. Uh, don't keep them up there like this, just a pop. And if you can imagine like seeing somebody that you haven't seen in a long time, like somebody that used to be your boy or uh, whatever, somebody you haven't seen in a while, you're excited to see, they're excited to see you, it is an involuntary thing we do that shows affiliation with somebody like, hey, right? It just, it conveys excitement to see somebody if you're just like, hey. So you can do that proactively when you're coming out and saying your name. Hi, my name is Rob Austin, something like that, right? Again, don't leave them up there because it looks like you're talking to a five-year-old. Don't pop them too many times, just one pop. Uh, <laughs> above all, facial expression should reinforce the message. So I say smile, but you don't have to smile the whole time. You probably should not smile the whole time. Uh, if you're talking, if you have some little sad part of your presentation, a kind of sad story, obviously don't smile during that part. Uh, yeah, body language. We're often told open body language is uh, the most appropriate thing to do while you're public speaking. Um, I've either heard this or that you should just stand with your arms to your sides, not moving at all. I definitely think this approach is a bad approach. Do not just stand with your arms to your side because it's super boring. You should be using your body language to reinforce what you're doing. That said, don't just stand like this the whole time and say, this is uh, open body language. Uh, you should be moving. You should, you should flow through what you're saying. Uh, open body language, uh, evolutionary psychologists have considered why we like open body language from presenters. 
on one hand, it shows that they are being vulnerable, right? They're not trying to cover themselves, protect themselves in any way. They're being vulnerable and transparent with you. And it shows that they are harmless, right? They're not yielding any weapons or ill intent towards you. So that's uh, why they've hypothesized that we like open body language. Uh, we wanna use a variety of gestures. Uh, it's okay to even uh, script or choreograph some gestures. A lot of times if I'm doing something like a timeline, I'll say, so over the next six months, uh, milestone one is to do this, milestone two is to do that, milestone three is to do that other thing, and milestone four is the end. So you can script out some things. If I'm talking about how big something is, or I'm talking about the whole world, the whole community, I might make a gesture like that and know ahead of time that I plan to make that gesture. The thing is you wanna practice these gestures when you're practicing your speeches so that when you get to that moment, the gestures are ready to go. Uh, and finally, some people engage in what I call self-soothing self gestures. So when they're engaged in public speaking, they'll kind of put their hands together and wring their hands, or they'll massage their arm. They'll do something that is intended to soothe themselves. They're not doing it intentionally. They're doing it unintentionally. It's just a kind of a, a, a nervous thing that they end up doing and don't realize that they're doing, like the speech disfluencies that we talked about before, again, you wanna be aware if you're doing these things so that you can try to uh, engage in a more confident posture and body language. Uh, above all, again, these should reinforce the message. You may hear that you should never cross your arms or look down while you're uh, speaking in public. Maybe you shouldn't, but if I was telling a, a sad story or something, I might do that if it was, you know, real life. So I think that temporarily adopting a posture like that can be appropriate if it reinforces your message. The thing is you want to be uh, direct and explicit in what you're doing. It's okay to seem nervous. Absolutely, I can forgive uh, students or uh, people pitching at tech events for being nervous all day, but do not seem bored. I cannot forgive somebody getting up and seeming like they are bored, seeming like they don't wanna be there because then I'm bored and I don't wanna be there and I feel like I've wasted my time. So seem like you wanna be there even if you have to fake it. Uh, now I'm gonna shift our topic a little bit and talk about uh, how we can improve. So, question, how do we run faster? How do we climb higher? How do we lift more weight than we ever have before? I don't know if you lift, but uh, I got into lifting fairly recently and I, uh, I have a goal to deadlift 405 pounds. Uh, I can uh, do hip thrusts of 405 pounds now. That was a goal, I met that goal. Now I wanna deadlift 405 pounds. I've only deadlifted 350 pounds, which feels insanely heavy. So I don't know how I'm supposed to add 55 pounds to that, but how do I do that? How do I get to that point where I can deadlift 405 pounds? Well, uh, this can be taken much more broadly. How do we get better at anything? How do we do anything better than we have before? We have to push ourselves to our limits and then exceed those limits. If we wanna run faster than we've ever run before, we have to run as fast as we've ever run before and then just a little bit faster. If I wanna lift more than 350 pounds, if I ever want to lift 405 pounds, I have to put that much weight on the bar and pick it up. So I have to put on 350 pounds and I have to put on a couple more low plates, a couple more plates, a couple more plates, build it up until I'm at 405 pounds. I have to exceed my limits. Same thing holds with public speaking and communication. So 
we can adopt a couple different perspectives when we're thinking about skill acquisition and performance. We can put our sir, ourselves in a learning zone performance or a performance zone or a, a learning zone perspective or a performance zone perspective. If we think about the learning zone, it's all about practicing. It is all about getting better at what we are doing. So that's about me putting less weight, right? Maybe me putting 225 or 315 on that bar so I get the motion down. This is about uh, saying, hey, you guys, I have the speech and let me practice it in front of you. The performance zone is I need to do this right now, right? Uh, I need to succeed at this thing. It is on the line and I need to execute. So again, learning zone is about improvement. Performance zone is about achieving success in a given moment. Uh, learning zone is mostly about unskilled areas. We want to work on our weaknesses more than our strengths. Uh, performance zone is things that we've mastered. We want to call upon the things that we know we're good at. Learning zone mistakes are encouraged. Why would we encourage mistakes? Because we learn a lot more often from our mistakes than we learn from our successes. There are usually many more ways to do something incorrectly than to do something correctly. Performance zone mistakes are absolutely avoided because we're trying to achieve success. Learning zone is low stakes, right? Uh, make your mistakes should be a low judgment environment. Performance zone can be any stakes. So, uh, you know, like if I just racked up 405 pounds and tried to lift it and it's just me there, like it's pretty low stakes, but it might be high stakes in my mind because I'm like, this is my go, right? So a lot of times we put ourselves in a performance zone unnecessarily uh, when we don't need to be, when we should really be in the learning zone. So... Let me ask this question. What do we think the ratio is between the learning zone and the performance zone for professional athletes? Let's think of uh, an NFL player, a starter on an NFL football team. How much time is this person actually playing per week? during a regular season game when they have a week, uh, when a uh, regular season week when they have a game. How much time are they actually playing? Well, the game lasts three or four hours, right? But it's not that much time. Uh, the, the actual game is only 60 minutes, but they're only playing one side of the ball probably, right? Uh, so offense or defense, so that takes us down to 30 minutes if they're a starter, but they're not playing that full 30 minutes. Most of the time they're just huddled up, right? It turns out that a professional football player might only be playing, like actually running and uh, hitting people, catching, uh, throwing, those kind of things for like 10, 12 minutes a week. 10 or 12 minutes of actual performance? And how much time did they spend preparing for that 10 or 12 minutes? How much time did they spend reviewing film, in the weight room, running drills, all that stuff? I don't know, 40, 50, 60 hours, I don't know. A lot of time for that couple minutes of performance. And we should think about our own work in a similar context. Uh, you can also think about musicians and performers. How much time are they spending practicing? A lot. Uh, great orators, how much time are they spending practicing their oratory skills? A lot for just a few minutes of performance. We can look at this learning zone and performance zone as an iterative process, something that we need to go through over and over again. So. We learn this certain skill, we perform it in a certain context, and we go back, reflect, and practice our weaknesses, 
Go back, perform it again, apply and perform, and just iterate through that process over and over again. So any individual public speaking event that you have, you should conceptualize as being part of this process. What can I learn from what I did before? And then when you're done with it, what did I learn from that experience that I can use to practice and to be better the next time? Practice is super important. Deliberate practice is super important. How you spend your time is much more important than how much time you spend. So if you spend your time practicing while you're trying, while you're, I don't know, on your phone and answering emails and doing all this other stuff, or you're just hanging out with your friends and like, oh, I'm gonna kind of practice this and you, no. When you are practicing, stop everything else. Focus in that time, make the most of that time. Take that time as being absolutely precious so that one, you get better and probably two, you spend less time practicing. Uh, distributed practice versus cramming. This is important when it comes to studying. It's also important in all manner of skill uh, acquisition. It's better to practice a little bit every day than try to practice a whole lot immediately before some event. So, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes a day is the way to go, not, you know, I'll just practice 14 hours the day before I need to do this thing. Uh, address your weaknesses more than your strengths, okay? We all like doing things that we're good at, but while you're in the practice zone, try to uncover and address those weaknesses. Uh, eliminate distractions, get instant feedback. If you can work with other people, please do so. Uh, you know, give your speech, give your pitch, and say, all right, I need to know where I messed up. Have them take notes throughout it if they can do so. Uh, work with others, super important, because you get their feedback, but you also learn by giving them feedback. Uh, remembering your pitch, this is, Obviously very important if you don't have the uh, ability to use cue cards or uh, a monitor that has your pitch on it. Don't always start from the beginning when you are practicing your pitch. That is tip number one here. Don't do it. It's uh, something that I call the piano recital effect. I don't know if you've ever been to a piano recital uh, with a bunch of little kids that get up and play some piano stuff. Generally, the first two minutes of the piano piece goes super well, right? And then it just totally falls apart. I see this when I have my students pitch in class. They'll get up, the first two, three minutes will go super well, and then it will all fall apart. Why does that happen? Because whenever they practiced it, they started from the beginning every time. They start from the beginning, they go until they make a mistake, and they start from the beginning again. They go until they make a mistake, they start from the beginning again. And maybe each time they get successively further into it, but they always go back and start from the beginning, such that by the time of the event, they've done the beginning over and over and over and over and over and over again, but maybe they've only done the ending a couple times. So, don't do that. Break your speech up, break a piece of music up, break whatever it is that you're practicing up into parts such that you can practice each one individually. Uh, expect things to go wrong during a pitch event. If it's a big event, I have seen microphones go out, okay? I have seen the slides uh, accidentally go off. You've gotta just keep rolling right? Something's going to go wrong. Even if it comes to your uh, speech, you're going to forget something that you intended to say. So you need to push through that if it happens. And that should be incorporated into your practice, right? At some point, you make that mistake. All right, just keep going. Don't go back to the beginning. Recover on the spot and push through. Uh, there are three strategies we can generally use to remember our pitches. Memorization, internalization, and improvisation. Memorization is 
literally trying to remember it word for word. So I wrote out this 600 word, four minute speech. I'm gonna try to memorize that 600 words. Internalization is, I wrote out this speech. I'm going to just try to remember the overall outline and the bullet points. Improvisation is, I didn't prepare at all and I'm just gonna just have at it. Which one of these seems like the best one? Memorization seems pretty safe, right? Because you know what you're gonna say, but it's risky. For the same reason I talked about a moment ago, it's like if you make a mistake, it's hard to recover because you know it is this like one continuous movement. So it can be effective, but you've got to be able to recover yourself if you lose the thread of what you're saying. Internalization is actually what I would probably recommend, knowing the overall outline, the overall structure of what you're gonna say, uh, maybe memorizing a, cute, a few key phrases and passages, but overall uh, keeping the structure a little bit more loose so that you can recover if you mess up. Improvisation, I don't recommend because as do just too much chance that something's gonna go wrong. Improvisation to me represents very poor uh, planning. So don't improvise a, uh, an important speech. Just don't do it. Uh, one of the biggest things you can do to improve is to record yourself and review it. You may not have that option available to you, but if you really want to improve and you do have that option, do it. Record yourself giving that speech, review it immediately thereafter, take notes, and the next time, improve. Iterate through that performance zone, learning zone process. Uh, something worth mentioning, mentor whiplash. If you are working with advisors, mentors, and what have you, you may receive conflicting feedback on a speech that you are preparing. All right, so you go and you practice a speech in front of your advisors, mentors, what have you. Somebody might really love that you have this certain story and they might say, I want you to take that story and uh, enhance it a bit. I want you to, I want more of that story. Somebody else might listen to that same story and say, That's th that story has no place in this speech. You need to get rid of that story first thing. You have to decide what works for you in situations like that. If you get conflicting feedback and you're kind of whiplashing, figure out what works for you. Make a decision as soon as you can so that that issue is settled and just move on. It is your speech, it is your pitch. Take their feedback into consideration, absolutely. Maybe ask a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth party for their opinion on the issue. Decide what works for you and do it. I want to uh, finish up here by talking through the stress response. Public speaking can be incredibly stressful. Uh, there are two types of public speakers, those who get nervous and those who are liars by Mark Twain. This is the uh, quote that I mentioned when I was talking about having short quotes. Uh, this one, appropriately short, inspirational quote, cultural reference, uh, good use here. And it's true, right? We all get nervous when we're doing public speaking. I love public speaking and I absolutely get nervous doing it. Yeah, I think that's part of the reason that I love it because it's invigorating for me. I think what separates good public speakers uh, from poor public speakers and indeed people who uh, perform well when things are on the line versus people who fall apart when things are on the line is that they're able to take that nervous energy and to channel it appropriately to achieve better performance. They're able to take the nerves, the energy, and just channel it well. So let's talk a little bit about the stress response. This uh, is delving a bit into the uh, physiology of it, so I hope you'll forgive me for just a few minutes, but there's a reason I'm talking about it. Uh, so if we have a stress response, 
First, the pupils in the eyes dilate, so we're taking in more light. Uh, the salivary glands absolutely will stop working. They're connected to the digestive system, uh, and if you've ever had the experience of getting up and speaking in front of a group of people and realizing that you have zero saliva in your mouth, it is so much more difficult to speak without saliva. So pro tip here, take a sip of water or something if you can before you get up and give that speech because that additional moisture can be very helpful. Um, the uh, heart begins to pump faster during a stress response. Uh, the lungs, the bronchi in the lungs dilate, so we're taking in more oxygen. Uh, the heart then, the, that's, you know, they kind of go together. The, lung, the lungs take in more oxygen, the heart speeds up its rhythms to deliver that fresh oxygenated blood to different parts of the body. Uh, the a body releases glucose uh, and adrenaline to get the body amped up. So it sends out glucose to your major muscles uh, so that they can uh, do major muscle stuff and uh, sends adrenaline again to get you pumped up and ready to go. It shuts down digestion. It shuts down anything going below the belt because when you're having a stress response, you don't need digestion going on, you don't need below the belt stuff going on. So that stuff is temporarily put on hold. Everything is transferred to this fight or flight or fright scenario. So you are ready to run, to fight, or to freeze and figure out what you're gonna do. This stress response is incredibly useful. It is a brilliant thing to have when it comes to acute physical stresses. So if we think about uh, lions and zebras on the African savanna, you need this stress response to keep you alive. If you are a zebra and you see a lion start to run at you, you need uh, your heart to be pumping as fast as possible. You need as much oxygen coming in through your lungs as possible. You need as much energy going to your muscles as possible. You don't need saliva, you don't need digestion, you don't need stuff going on below the belt. At that point in time, you just need to run. Same thing if you're the lion and you start to run. All you need to do is run as fast as possible, as fast as possible. So great that we have the stress response. It has allowed our species to survive for a very long time. It has allowed life to survive for a very long time. It is not so helpful when it comes to psychological and social stresses. So when we're getting up and trying to give a speech, it's not so good to have literal energy like coursing out to our muscles in the form of glucose and adrenaline because it makes us kind of shaky. It's not good for our salivary glands to shut down because we need that saliva to speak. So it can be very deleterious to what we're trying to do. And as humans, we are unique in having the stress response in a reflective and anticipatory and a purely imaginary way. So it can happen real time, but it can also happen, you can have a stress response because you're remembering some stressful event that happened to you when you were a kid, right? You can have a stress response now just remembering Oh, that day that I didn't get picked for kickball, man, that was a terrible day. Uh, whatever it was, you can stress out about it now. You can stress out about something that's gonna happen in the future. So if you have a pitch event in you know, a month or two weeks, you can have a stress response about it right now. And we can have stress responses for purely imaginary things. If you're like, Rob, the aliens, man, they're gonna come and get me. Uh, yeah, they're not, uh, but you can stress about it if you want to. Uh, an interesting thing about the stress response is we perceive things, we perceive others as being more threatening than they actually are. So you're more likely to look out into an audience and be like threat, 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 right? Threat assessment level high. Uh, then you are to look out and see friendly faces. Again, realize that anybody who's coming to watch a pitch event, uh, 
is probably there because they want to be there and they probably want to see you succeed. So what can we do about the stress response? Well, the research offers uh, one possibility called the power pose. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the idea is that you can uh, adopt a Superman pose or just some kind of powerful pose for two minutes and your testosterone will go up and your cortisol will go down. That sounds great. Testosterone is a potent feel-good chemical and cortisol is a stress chemical, so that'd be great. And uh, the researcher here, a primary researcher, Amy Cuddy, she has this TED Talk with millions of views. She gets paid speaking gigs to talk about this stuff, but... It failed replication, and one of the researchers admitted they engaged in a tactic known as p-hacking, wherein you play with the statistics so you get this certain number below a certain threshold, and it's very bad science. It's actually unethical uh, from a purely scientific perspective. Uh, one of the researchers now has no faith in the embodied effects of power poses, doesn't study or teach it, teach it and discourages others from doing so. So unfortunately, this isn't going to work for us. I mean, you're still welcome to power pose if you want to. Uh, I always imagine like people who want to power pose but don't want to see other people see them doing it. So they like kick in the door to a bathroom stall and just stand in the stall like this for two minutes. Uh, but you don't need to waste your time with it. Let's talk about some things that I, I think can help us to work through some of the stress. Uh, first is acclimation. The more often we engage in public speaking, the better we're going to be at public speaking because we can cycle through the performance zone, learning zone more times, but also the more we can learn to channel that nervous energy into uh, engagement, right? Rather than disengagement by seeming nervous. So the more we do it, ostensibly the better we will become at it. Uh, social support. As I've said a couple times now, the people who are there observing you give this speech, this pitch, they're there because they wanna be there, right? They're not there because they wanna see you fail. So uh, they're gonna forgive your nervousness, probably, right? They're gonna forgive some mistakes as long as you seem like you're trying. And, you know, uh, I mean, of course, we love a perfectly smooth presentation, but we're gonna socially support you either way, as long as we feel like you're giving it, uh, you know, a good effort. Uh, a sense of control. Realize that you have more control than you probably feel like you have. I would tell anybody who's engaged in public speaking, if you have a moment where you feel like you are derailing, like things are just falling apart on you, take a step back, take a deep breath, and then step back into it. I don't know if you remember uh, like elementary school, whenever the class would start to get a little crazy and the teacher's like, everybody sit down and take a deep breath, right? And you're like, no. And the teacher's like, I said, sit down and take a deep breath. At some point, the teacher would get you to sit down and take a deep breath. And it does have kind of a calming effect. Go ahead, try, try it with me. <sighs> it just gives you that sense of control. So again, if you feel like things are derailing, take a step back, take a deep breath, collect yourself, step back up and do your thing. Uh, cognitive appraisal. This is uh, also important. Realize that whatever speech or pitch you're giving is probably not the most important speech or pitch you will give in your whole life. I tell my students very explicitly, if this speech that you have to give for this class is the most important speech that you ever give in your life, you will have wasted your life, okay? So keep it in mind. What are the actual, like what's the worst case outcome from this speech that you have to give? Probably not that bad. So just let that calm you down just a little bit. Still try, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, and finally, I want to talk about the utility of worrying. 
So uh, I know a lot of people out there are chronic worriers and we feel like uh, the more we worry about things, about life, the more likely we are to be prepared if something goes wrong. Uh, so we feel like there is some value associated with worrying, but uh, psychologists say, and I don't know that the number is true, but I do believe that the sentiment behind it is true, that 85% of the things we worry about either never come to pass or have positive or neutral effects on our lives. So overall point is a lot of the burden that we carry worrying about things is unnecessary. Uh, I want to finish up just a couple final thoughts here. When we meet new people, when we see people for the first time, uh, whether it's walking into uh, an MBA classroom or uh, meeting uh, somebody at a public speaking event for the first time, seeing somebody on stage, whatever it is, there are four general categories in which we can put people that we meet, okay? One of those categories is liking. So we can meet somebody and we can like that person. We can just feel a sense of affiliation with that person. Right? I wanna be friends with this person. I wanna have another conversation to some future point in time with this person, just like this person. Seems like a good person. What's the second category? If there's liking, then there is disliking or at an extreme hating somebody. And so you can meet somebody and you can dislike them for a couple different reasons. One, you might find them to be intimidating or something like, oh, this person kind of scares me. I don't like that person. Or you might feel that the person is weak and incompetent. So like, oh, I don't like that person. There's two. What's the third one? It's kind of a variation of like, is where you, uh, you want to pass somebody the salt, you kind of like like them. Uh, so that's, that's the fourth one, you, you love them or you feel lust for them, whatever it is. And the fourth category, what do you think the fourth category is? Hmm? It is ambivalence. It is just disinterest, basically. It is realizing that that person is a person, but to you, they might as well be a table or a chair or just some other thing, okay? You don't care. And uh, which category is our biggest category when we meet other people? What is our typical response to others? Is it liking, disliking, uh, like-liking, or ambivalence? It's ambivalence, right? We just don't have enough room in our lives, in our hearts, uh, enough time or energy to go through the world putting everybody into a like, dislike, like-like category. It is necessary that our biggest category is don't care. And what we have to realize is that that response is other people's most likely response to us as individuals for the very same reasons. Doesn't make us bad people, doesn't make them bad people. That's the most likely response we would encounter. We need to change that, right? For the sake of ourselves, for the sake of our ideas, if we want to be successful purveyors of our ideas, we have to get people to like us as soon as possible. And I know you're like, Rob, Rob, I want everybody to like, like me. You don't, not for the sake of your ideas, because if the only thing they're thinking about is passing you the salt, they're not really listening to what you have to say. We need to get into the like category as soon as we can. 
communication provides us with that vessel, okay? Provides us with a means to be perceived as competent, leader-like, and trustworthy. Again, my name is Rob Austin McKee with mgt.edu, the Open Access Business School. See you next time.